Welcome to Boing Boing TV. I'm Shani Jardin, and I'm here inside the offices of the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco. And today, we're going to learn about memory and how your computer can be tricked into revealing information you might not want to reveal. With me is Jake Applebaum. And Jake and a bunch of researchers uh, came up with this. It's called the cold boot exploit, is that right? Uh, yeah, we wrote a paper that's called the cold boot attack. And it's basically a submission for the Usenix security conference that's happening this summer in San Jose. And, and you have a can of, what is this? It's compressed air. <laughs> and, and, so, and the reason that you have this is what? Well, so it turns out that compressed air um, is just you know, air. But if you turn it upside down, the propellant is actually very cold. And you don't want to touch it, but right. if you were to spray this on some memory chip, um, you would be able to cool the memory. And when you cool the memory, it turns out that there's a phenomenon, which is a pretty well documented phenomenon, about memory retention. So, so you basically, by freezing the chip in the computer, you trick it into sharing information that was encrypted. Well, the, the deal is that uh, it turns out that the way that most disk cryptography is implemented, and it's not just disk cryptography, it can be lots of different things, you know, Mozilla Firefox, and for like what web browser you were using, um, like whatever data you were browsing on the web at that time. If you were to uh, cool the memory and then power the machine off, you could then take the chips and put them in another computer, and then you could extract the data, and there are secrets in there, not necessarily um, not necessarily secrets that you wouldn't want to share, but in the case of disk cryptography, those secrets keep your encrypted hard drive safe. And in the case of uh, some of the attacks we have, we don't have to remove the memory chips at all. And cooling is, you know, not necessarily required, but it certainly makes it a nice uh, little spin. Um, one is a network-based attack, which maybe we'll do. And we have a USB-based uh, attack that is actually uh, set up to work inside of an iPod. So the iPod works just like normal. If you look at it, it's a normal Apple firmware. But if you boot off of it, it boots a special custom program. And that program rips all of the memory out of the machine and puts it into a separate partition, which we can extract later, and then unplug from the computer and listen to the iPod on the way out. Cool. So well, cool. let's go see how. OK. So let's say I was writing a top secret document for the NSA could in Microsoft document, Word. Could have been a spreadsheet, could have been you were browsing a web page, could have been your instant messenger client was open. Um, the contents of whatever you're working on had to be stored in memory temporarily, and if you reset the computer before it has a chance to be erased, you can capture it. Uh, as, as long as the, the contents don't disappear in the process of resetting the computer. Um, and using the canned air to keep the memory chips cool while you power cycle, it increases the chances of being able to recover useful data. Okay, so let's say that I was um, spending some quality time with dolphinporn.com, and you came up with this iPod and plugged the iPod into my laptop. Uh, how, uh, talk to me about exactly what would happen. I would have to reset your computer, so uh, either power it off and power it back on very quickly, um, possibly having to cool the chips in, before I power it off, uh -huh. um, or if your laptop has a feature to reset it, which some computers do, you can do a very quick reset without powering off in which case you won't lose the contents of the memory. Um, with some computers, as soon as you turn them back on, they perform a destructive memory test, which may overwrite the contents. So that would kind of clean away any traces of dolphinporn.com. Yes. In that particular case, and so the, so the memory dump is finished and the machine turns off. Um, and that's great because now the, the program that was in memory, if you keep the machine off for long enough, it will go away and that right. will be recoverable. Um, but in, in the particular case of um, the machine, uh, like if you have the machine and you want to like keep the data safe, or you want to uh, you want to make sure that someone can't uh, dump the memory from your computer, there are lots of things you can try to do. Like you could set a BIOS password, but it turns out that setting a BIOS password isn't actually that useful because if you don't know the BIOS password, it'll just sit there at the prompt and power the memory chips. So there's there's lots of little caveats to trying to to defend against this attack, and one of the Real th one of the real takeaways from this is that it's very, very hard to defend against this attack. You can get some free countermeasures, like OpenBSD is one of the first operating systems to build in some, some preliminary countermeasures. It turns out that new DDR3 memory chips have um, an I2C bus device that can tell you the temperature of the memory. 
So in theory, BIOS manufacturers, if they care about this threat, will be able to actually um, set an interrupt that will say, okay, the memory chip just dropped 10 degrees Celsius. This is obviously someone trying to freeze our memory and then do something as a response. Because the only reason that you might freeze memory or one of the reasons that one might freeze memory is so that you could extract information right. by bypassing other Right. controls that would normally be in place. Exactly. The different types of memory all have different features, like some have the, the sensor temperature, but basically that's memory is not found in the wild. Right. So you're not going to be able to deal with the temperature sensor. The MacBook Pro, for example, has a temperature sensor near the memory controller, but you'd have to know that, that temperature sensor existed and then you'd have to care about the attack. So explain to me the significance of what we're seeing on your screen. Well, I'm restoring the memory which was saved onto the iPod onto mm -hmm. my, my so for every instance of Boeing, let's pretend that's uh, information from dolphinporn.com. Information I did not want you to see. Right. So all I'm really doing now is using a simple program just to look for the string Boeing. Yeah. Now I know ahead of time that the string Boeing will be here. Um, so uh, in a real case, I would have to just look through it and, and search for interesting data. I would find text strings, some of which might be... Um, Dolphins are beautiful. Which, now in the case of the, um, the encryption key recovery, um, we have a program to actually look for AES encryption keys um, based on the way that the key schedule is created from them. So we know ahead of time how to find that particular pattern of data and search for it. Okay, so one example of how, I mean, this all sounds sort of very cerebral, very academic, something that I think regular people might have a hard time realizing why this is important. Now, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that you could use this kind of attack to get someone's encryption key so that you could unlock other information that they may have stored in other places? Yes. Well, I mean, the, the basic principle is people have assumed that, it, especially with disk encryption, um, the fact that it's encrypted and I don't know the key means that if I steal the laptop or your computer, I can't decode your information. But the key necessarily has to be stored in memory while the computer is working. It's normally assumed that you can't get at it very easily. And you've found a way to get at it. Yes, exactly. And, and, and depending on the hardware platform and the operating system in use and the implementation of the hard drive encryption or whatever like security software that's being used, um, if you can time the power off, if you have a specific targeted attack, you can do pretty interesting stuff. Uh, a MacBook Pro, for example, when you, when you shut the lid, it automatically goes into sleep mode. Yeah. And that means that it also does a thing called safe sleep, where it writes the contents of memory, usually out to, and by default, out to the hard drive, so that if the power is lost, it will restore the contents of memory, and you know you get the little progress bar along the bottom of the screen. But the beautiful thing about the way that Apple does it, and the way anyone that does this spend a RAM without any sort of password authentication, is that you have a system where uh, if you lose power on the machine, and say you wanted to pull the memory out to look at the memory on the machine, you would then be able to put the memory back in and then open the laptop with a power supply, and it would restore right back to the place where the user last was, and they wouldn't even know that they'd been attacked. If only I could unsee what I've seen with these eyes. <laughs> Two girls, one cup was just the start. <laughs>